What you're about to see are the real and personal experiences of seven runners in our nation. These stories are not fiction. These people are not actors. These are real, personal experiences of pain from your fellow seven runners. We invite you to listen, not to respond or to rebut, but to feel the pain of your brothers and sisters as your own so that we can begin to move forward as one. Good morning. My name is Hank Bellinger, 79 years old, born in Salem, Virginia, but I had the privilege of spending many, many years in the military. I was able to travel all over the United States of America and other parts of the globe. Racism and segregation is something that I've had to live with. I've had to live with it at work. I've had to live with it in all of the environments that we're faced with. But today I wanted to speak to you briefly of one of the early uh, involvements, if you will, of trying to understand uh, your place. And this had to do when I was about six years old, uh, living in Salem, Virginia, and standing on my front porch when one of our neighbors, a white man and his son came to see my grandfather. My grandfather was, was my idol. Uh, he feared no man and he could do anything. But when the guy came to visit him, they had a nice conversation because they were friends. And I was standing beside my grandfather and the gentleman who came to see my dad had his son who was about my age standing with him. And when uh, he dealt with my granddad and his business, he said, well, I'll see you later, Ed. And my granddad said, okay, I'll see you later, Dan. Then this little guy, about by, he spoke up. He said, well, I'll see you later, Ed. Well, when he said that, I thought I had every right to say, I'll see you later, Dan. But as soon as they left, my uh, grandmother uh, called me to the side. And she said, son, she said, uh, don't you ever, and I'll quote her, I'll never forget this. She said, don't you ever call a white man by his name. And she didn't further explain it, but I learned later on that her fear was that uh, he would go back, tell some of his friends that this little uppity colored boy around the hill uh, sassed me. And that if I were to go out in the evening somewhere, you never can tell what might would happen. So this is the kind of early thing that you learn early on you know about the water fountains. You know about the streets that you need not go down, come back in the afternoon and come back before too dark. But these are the things that stay with you kind of for the rest of your life. Uh, can you feel my pain? Thank you. One of my experiences with racism happened in 1965 uh, with the desegregation of schools in Virginia I had to leave a school, friends, and teachers that I loved to go to a school that didn't want me there. I didn't want to be there, but I didn't have a choice. When we got to the school, there were no African American teachers on staff, so I felt like, you know, we really didn't have the allies in that school. I really felt lost. 
Um, one of my teachers was Mrs. T. She taught home economics. And Mrs. T did not like African Americans. She treated all, me and all the African American girls in her class different than she treated everybody else. Uh, she didn't help us with any projects. She really ignored us. So I really felt invisible in her class. At the end of the semesters when we got our grade, I got an F in home ec. My first F, I've never gotten an F in my life. And all of the African American girls in her class got an F. You know, I felt angry. You know, uh, it made me feel like I was stupid. And I felt devalued because I felt like I would never measure up to what she wanted because I would never be white. Can you feel my pain? Several years ago, about 20 to be exact, I used to work for a men's clothing store that was part of a national chain. And I'd gone to work one day and actually opened the store, uh, worked a full day when we got the call that one of the other stores in our region needed some help. A lot of the folks that scheduled to work that day at that location had called out sick. So when I got off, I made my way over to the other location and when I met my colleague there, uh, because I had already worked a full day at my store and tended to customers, we agreed that since they received shipment that day, that I would work the back of the store processing the, the inventory while he would work the front, tending to any customers that might come in. We expected it to be a slow day because it was the early part of the week. Uh, so we thought this was a good plan. As I processed the inventory and uh, finished doing so, I actually finished sooner than I thought, or than we thought, so I decided to go ahead and restock the merchandise that was out on the, sh out on the racks. Uh, and this meant repeated tip, uh, trips rather, to the back storeroom, bringing out the new inventory and taking down the old. Growing up in the South, particularly in North Carolina, I'd grown to understand and recognize um, looks and stares coming my way when anyone doing the looking and the staring thought that maybe I was out of place, maybe that I didn't belong. I noticed two customers that had come in uh, staring and curiously looking at me and wondering what I was doing. And I even overheard them ask each other, what's that guy back there doing? What's that black guy doing in the back? Is he trying to steal those things? Even though I would already have already by now ascended the executive ranks in the federal government, I still recognize those stares and understand what those looks mean. My colleague, after dealing with one customer, came to them and asked what was the matter, and they shared with, her, with him, rather, what they thought was going on, or at least questioned. And he said, who, him? That guy? He's our regional manager. Actually, one of the top salespersons, not only in our district, but across our region. See, in that moment 20 years ago, and even still today, there are moments when I feel undervalued, less than, out of place and unwanted. Can you feel my pain? I grew up in the South, in the state of Louisiana. One thing I appreciate is the fact that you know where you stand with people. People tell you exactly how they feel about you and what they think about you. My parents were products of the Civil Rights Movement. And at an early age, they told me about the value of education. I can remember being pulled over by the cops. They deemed it probable cause. Can you imagine being pulled over and being called boy? Can you imagine having to answer questions regarding how you could afford a car? I moved to Virginia, where I attended Virginia Tech. There I pursued my PhD. Can you imagine 
being in a classroom where you're the only minority, where the conversation focuses on cross burnings, tactics used to drive persons from neighborhoods. Upon graduating, I began work with the federal government. Can you imagine being around a group of older white males where everyone addresses them as doctor? But when it came to me, oh, that's just Terrence. Can you imagine the disrespect? Can you feel my pain? When I was a sophomore in college, I became study partners with a white classmate in our calculus class. It was a tough class and uh, we helped each other through it and got to the end of the semester. I uh, didn't see her much over the next couple of years, but occasionally passed her on campus. We caught up uh, one last time, uh, very near the end of our senior years in college and stopped there on the quad on campus. And as we were talking, talking about uh, next plans, we both discovered that we were going to law school. And so we started talking about the law school admissions process, where we'd gotten into, where we didn't. She had gotten into a great number of schools. She was really excited. An awesome school that she had decided to attend. Came to me, I told her where I was going. It's a good school. And when I shared with her where I was headed, it's like her demeanor immediately changed. It was disbelief and then it turned to anger. Almost furious it seemed at the news I had shared with her. She looked at me and just said, you know, you only got into that school because of affirmative action. Then she topped it off by saying, Jody, I'm gonna be your boss one day. Uh, suffice it to say, the conversation ended a, a bit awkwardly. Um, and I was angry, but as I walked away and as the conversation replayed in my mind uh, in, the, in the next few weeks, in the next few months, I was hurt by what she had said. I, was, I was, felt disrespected. And even though I knew that I had done what I needed to do academically to, to go to the school where I was headed, those comments allowed some self-doubt to, to creep in. Like, you know, I just wasn't good enough. Or, you know, like, uh, I was only there because I was a Lumbee Indian and I was filling some kind of diversity quota that they had. Her comments just made me feel like I wasn't up to par. And, and ultimately that I could never be on her level or, or be in the position that she was in. I'd never achieved that. Can you feel my pain? honor student at Arundel Middle School. In October of 2016, because of my national origin, something happened to me that dramatically changed my life. A group of girls were spreading rumors about me that were completely untrue. When I became aware of the rumors, I tried to explain that I had no knowledge of the event being discussed. One girl in particular, who was the instigator of the rumor, threatened me with bodily harm. My name was written on bathroom walls calling me a Mexican bee and other insulting comments about me. It made me feel insecure and confused because these girls were my close friends and out of nowhere turned completely against me. I made every attempt to resolve the situation with the school administration and the girl. However, the bullying and threats to harm me continued. Because of the continued threats, I enrolled at Liberty University Online Academy, where I continued to excel in my studies. I no longer enjoy the companionship of friends in the hallways, at lunch, or after school activities. There will be no homecoming dances or football games to attend. 
I feel lonely, not because of my choice, but because of the abusive and discriminatory actions of one African-American girl who chose to discriminate against a Mexican-Argentinian girl for no reason other than my race. Can you feel my pain? When I was 10 years old, I remember being at my cousin's house. We heard a lot of altercation, a lot of noise coming from outside. So we went to the window to see what was going on. And I remember seeing a black male and he was standing there with his hands up. And he was facing a white cop. The cop kept yelling, you know, don't move, don't move. And it was weird because he wasn't moving. He wasn't even saying anything. But eventually the cop decided to turn him around and handcuff him. And we weren't sure what was going on or why. And the cop shoved him down face first to the ground. And then another cop came out of nowhere and I'm assuming it had to be his partner. And the cops, they took out their sticks and they began to beat him. And they began to stomp him. And I just remember hearing screams. And I remember hearing people shout, you know, stop. Like, he's not doing anything. He's not moving. But they kept going. And then this lady, she had to been about 70 years old. She walked towards him. She was leaning down towards him and to cover him. She wanted to help taking some of what was going on. And the cop took his stick and raised it towards her and went to swing towards her. And when she realized that, she stopped and she backed up. And it was at that moment, it was like an awkward silence. No more screaming, no more shouting, just tears. It was then I felt helpless. You know, as a child, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand what was going on. I'm an adult now, and these things are still happening. The worst part about this for me, I'm a mother. I'm a mother of a little boy. And my little boy has to grow up. And one day he'll be another black male. And I have to tell him when he comes to me one day, I have to tell him, son, even though you may be doing everything right, you are still wrong. That makes me feel like any other mother would feel if they have to say that to their son. The difference is not every mother has to experience that. Just ones that look like me. Can you feel my pain? Forgiveness is the garment of our courage The power to make the peace we long to know Open up our eyes To see the wounds that bind All of humankind This isn't a story that I choose to tell. It's a story that chose me to tell it. As a believer, I know that all things, even very painful things, are working together for my good. It was in 1984 that as a top scholar in my school, I was chosen to go on a college tour of historically black colleges and universities. And this was a very exciting time in my life because I was getting ready to choose which college I was going to attend. We traveled from Pittsburgh 
to DC, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and then into Georgia. It was during one of our many pit stops that a few of us girls went to go use the restroom. And the place was already crowded and, you know, with a, with a bus full of students, it was, you know, it was even more, more so. So we had to wait. There was a little girl waiting in line who went to go use a stall after one of my classmates when her mother stopped her and said, don't use that one, honey. A nigger just used it. The earth felt like it stood still. I remember how little I remember after those words were spoken, but I do remember an overwhelming silence. I remember the complicity of every adult who stood in that space and chose not to say anything. And I remember a little girl who had to grow up with the boisterous voice of racism while we were left with the piercing screams of silence. In that time, silence was so painful. Can you feel my pain? So where are we headed in our journey into redeeming racism? Well, I want to share with you that we're headed to someplace a little bit deeper than, than um, you know, is common in our culture. Uh, we're not headed towards a tolerant diversity. Um, I neither want to tolerate you, nor do I want to be tolerated. That, to me, is not the vision of God. It's not towards some uneasy alliance. I was reading the other day on some materials on reconciliation, rac racial reconciliation, and and the statement said, so you become a white ally. I said, no, it's not the vision. It's not some kind of a distance detente or any relationship that leaves us as aliens. You know what an alien is, right? <laughs> an alien is somebody that's not like me, somebody not from here, something that is other. And however nuanced we make that, that reality, the vision of God was never to create uh, sons and daughters uh, who were alienated from one another. You see, God created every person from before the, the world ever began in his heart and mind. God knew every soul and imagined every individual that he would create in his image. These would be image bearers who would, who would enjoy relationship with him and who would, who would share his glory. And we in the garden, all of us, we chose to enthrone ourselves. We chose to be like Satan and exalt our own pride, our own independence. And, and honestly, it is as though we took a brick and threw it through a plate glass window in the world and it shattered into 10,000 pieces. And we have been living east of Eden on broken glass ever since that day. One of the responses to the brokenness of the world is to underestimate the broken and to deny it and to normalize insanity. And that's what we've done with racism. We've normalized insanity. It has gone underground. It is a, it is a part of our culture. It is sophisticated. It is, it is a long part of our history. It is conscious and it is unconscious. It's personal and it's systemic. And it's all a part of what's deeply broken and what God refused to stay away from. So where we're headed is, is to something that fulfills the vision of God from the beginning. You see, Satan doesn't win. Can I remind you? That Satan succeeded in destroying the world and, and bringing uh, cancer to the soul and sorrow to the heart and alienating us from one another. Even in our closest relationships, we still feel the distance. And we try to bridge the gap, but, but in this broken world, we feel the isolation. It is the aloneness of hell that has invaded earth, and, and the lie of hell is that broken wins. But the declaration of God in Christ is that love wins. And so Jesus came to planet earth, not as an idealist and not as a teacher. Jesus came to planet earth as redeemer, 
as Lord, as Savior. And what he seeks to do is not create a religious people who are kind of immersed in their cultures and and adopt the brokenness of the, the flow of history. Jesus came to create a new humanity to redeem what hell tried to steal. And that is why God so loved the world that he gave. And that his one and only son would offer the chance to be a part of this coming kingdom, to be a part of this redemption, to be a part of the glass being, being no longer the ground upon which we walk with bare feet, but to put it all back together in a beautiful way that would forever and ever again then fulfill the original vision of God. So where we're headed is not some watered-down tolerance and, and, and you know, awkward dance with, with, with each other where we, we pretend there are no problems or whether we, 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 you know, we just kind of, kind of get this close and then just act like that's all God can do. No. Where we're headed to is, is an uncommon unity uh, where we're... God does something in Christ and that we become the race that is bought by blood. Because God is not going to allow his human race to be shattered by Satan's uh, rebellion and pride and work and, and he invites everyone who believe into his redeeming love to put all things together again and make all things new again. On the last night of his life, in John 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus is praying a prayer. All the disciples are, are off, uh, you know, on this side. Uh, they're off and on asleep. Um, they have not gotten his life. They have not understood his purpose, the grand vision that, that God has for redeeming humanity. And so here Jesus is alone. He came without title, he came without human power, he came uh, as the surprising incarnation of an infinite God in one body that was unremarkable in and of itself. And there he is kneeling on the last night of his life, praying this prayer, a prayer which would reveal uh, the, the ultimate plan of God which would, would go back to the beginning and connect uh, the future together and, and would show the heart and the goal of God's vision for his created children, all of them. My prayer is not for them, that is just the original disciples, those over there asleep. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that's us. And if you believe the world can't change, then, then again, you, you really can't be a believer in Christ because he is a world changer. We believe because people before us believed. And so Jesus said, I'm praying for, for us, he's praying for us that they will believe in me that all of them, listen to this, may be one. Now, we hear messages of unity um, in kind of a, a shallow way, but I want you to hear God, the infinite, speaking in time about the plan of the Creator to overcome shattered and to, to restore the intended purpose from the beginning. One humanity, one race redeemed. May they be one, Father, listen to this, just as you are in me and I am in you. This is a picture of the, the trinity, the triunity of perfect relationship, not in competition, of complementary relationship, where individuality is maintained, but, but, but love is, is that which reveals and creates and inspires this connection where there is no lonely, there is no apart, there is no other. May they also be in us. Listen to that. This, this restored race, this kingdom of God come on earth that, that will be forever and ever the reality of, of all of eternity. This kingdom come is a kingdom that, that is going to be a kingdom that is literally in the very heart of God. May they be also in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, with the same closeness, the same love. I in them and you in me, 
Can you hear the heart of Jesus? He's alone in all of humanity. This, this vision of together is, is at this moment a, a, a vision of complete loneliness as he is kneeling and he's the only one who gets it. And still he believes. Do you get the vision of God? Do you understand what he was trying to do in Christ? Do you understand why Jesus came? It wasn't just for you and I individually. It was, it was to recreate what he planned from the beginning. One uncommon unity in one united race bought by his blood. And every word Jesus is praying, he's knowing the seconds are counting down to the moment when he will be beaten, flogged, and nailed. I and them and you and me, so they may be brought together to complete unity. No distance between their hearts and souls. No categories of other. This is a common humanity with a common father, brother and sister in the most eternal, truest sense of the word. And then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And after these words, Jesus, with more courage than any man who's ever walked planet earth has shown, he got up and he bled to make it true. So I want you to have a grander vision of what God started with in the beginning and of what will be in the end. Behold, I am making all things new, Revelation 21. To him who is thirsty, come, and you can be a part of this. If, if you don't see the need, if, if walking broken glass um, and living in pain in the world is what you choose to do apart from me, I will let you, but I have loved you from before the foundation of the world, and I have called you to myself, and I have given you myself that we might be one. So where we're going is an uncommon unity found only in the blood of Christ. Because I want to tell you guys, racism will not be ended by education. It will not even be ended by, transfer, by, by conversation as, as important as conversation is. Racism will be ended in transformation through the blood of Christ. When the human heart is changed, when it comes home, when it bends the knee to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. So how do we get there? Well, we begin at the beginning. And in the most simplest ways, we start where we are with transparency, with authenticity, and with empathy. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen for pain and to love like God. You see, in Exodus 3, chapter 7, we are told of, of a God who hears the pain of hurting people. Not deserving people, but hurting people. I have heard their cry, God says, of those enslaved by the Egyptians. If you are a person who's ever loved anybody and have ever experienced a, a child in pain, you know as a parent what you would do to end that pain. And so, Father, from that moment forward, well, from the beginning forward, plan on buying back a new humanity with the blood of his son. And what the blood does is it changes us. It breaks our pride. It replaces I with Christ. It transforms us from proud and self-sufficient to humble and Christ-dependent. It changes us from people who have all the answers to people who follow the answer in Christ. 
It changes the language that we use. And our longing for justice is not merely a longing uh, for justice for ourselves, but for those around us. It is, it is to have a heart that is filled now with mercy undeserved. Because no one who has received grace can live a graceless life. It is not possible. And yet so many of us mock the blood of Christ in our living. And we live our unredeemed lives um, uh, as though, again, Christ were some kind of icing on the cake of, of our, our lives instead of Christ being our, our lives. Guys, nobody really needs to know your opinion. What they really, really, really need is to know they are loved. Mercy is the way of Christ. And those who would be quick to dispense justice on the other, do you want God to dispense justice on your head at the judgment? I promise you, I promise you, I promise you that the toughest, uh, most cruel person in all the world at the judgment of God, standing there in the glory of God, it, again, it's, it's not even a good analogy, but, but imagine being near the surface of, of the sun with all of its power and all of its burning fury and, and, and you're a speck of dust, uh, you know, with this, you know, this giant star and that's infinitely less than you and I will be before God the infinite. If you live mercilessly now, you will receive no mercy. If you mock the need for receiving the blood and giving the mercy of the blood, then on that day, you will receive judgment without mercy. So, so what does that mean? Well, James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everybody should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. These are not attributes to try to be learned and lived up to. They, they reflect the surrender of a heart to the work, the transforming work of, of grace. Instead of us living needy and, and having to have everybody know our pain and our opinions and what we think is right, we have given our lives to Jesus. He carries our pain. He heard our cry. He's answered our pain. Now we are free to look around in a broken world at other people still walking barefoot on the glass of sin and to hear their pain. Instead of, instead of talking over people or judging them or summing them up in a second, you just shut up. You just listen past the barriers, past the, 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 the walls, past all of the reasons why you could judge, realizing that God could judge you too. And having foregone judgment, mercy flows in your life and you just listen. And you're not waiting for them to finish speaking so that you can give your opinion, you're listening. And what are we listening for? What's their pain? Because it is, is at the point of everyone's pain that Christ can make all things new. And living in mercy, we love like God. It is not weakness. Oh, well, Pastor, this is just liberal and it's soft on crime. And do you really want the judgment of God? sitting across from uh, a heroin addict um, who probably was a very regular thief and, um, you know, very 
hard in his face and, and, um, and very aggressive in his demeanor, it would be easy to judge that man and to think I know him and to you know, say, well, you're about to get what you deserve at your sentencing. No. This is a child of God lost in this world, driven um, by their pain, and they need mercy. In listening, we seek God's understanding. In speaking, we reveal our own. God's voice is easy to miss, especially when we're talking. I don't really like these arbitrary categories. <laughs> well, <laughs> Siri, thank you for your additions. <laughs> Just need you to listen to me now, please. People need to feel Jesus. They need to feel Jesus loving them through you. On Facebook, can I say that people really don't need to know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat? What they need from you is Jesus. With all my heart, I believe that we can make a difference. And I believe that if we boldly go back to the vision of what Jesus was all about in coming to earth, what he was trying to do with his humanity, that one day he will gather uh, before all the nations gathered and, and the sheep and the goats will be separated and, and the nation that is gathered before him is one race bought by the blood who will share for all of eternity an uncommon unity and love and joy in Christ to the same degree that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit enjoy one another forever. Will you give your pain to Jesus? Being vulnerable, being transparent, being authentic, will you then let Jesus use your life to listen to the pain of others and to love like he loves?